All right, if you'd like to open up your Bible to Ezekiel chapter 17. Ezekiel chapter 17. And we're going to look at a few passages uh, there, verses 22 to verse 24, just ever so briefly before getting back to Mark. Uh, sorry for that slip up during the communion while ago. I was reading 2 Kings 4.8 in the King James Version right before standing up. So, you know, that happens sometimes. Um, but today we're going to look at Ezekiel 17, not 2 Kings 9 verse 8 or whatever that passage was. <laughs> Um, I want to talk, though, very briefly about something that I've ex been experiencing in my own spiritual life. Uh, I don't know how long it's been going on. I guess sometime now. And it has to do with this really neat uh, concept in uh, the Celtic tradition called thin places. Have you ever heard of that expression, thin, a thin place? When Jesus prayed in Matthew chapter 6, and he taught his disciples to pray, he said that they were to pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Another way to put this is uh, God has heaven figured out pretty good. We just hope that that will kind of spill over into the earth, that the order and justice and mercy and love that's demonstrated in heaven and even the awe and wonder that's in heaven will spill over into the earth. That's what is in heaven will be done on earth. A thin place then is a place where it seems that heaven and earth meet. You might have a place, like an actual place, that's your thin place. Uh, one of my friends just last week, uh, he was talking about his garden, and we were asking him about how it was going and how it, how it's, uh, you know, what kind of crops did he plant and all that kind of stuff. And he was talking about uh, how much work he had to do when he got back home from church camp. And he said, it's going to be just me and Jesus from one end of one row all the way to the other. The garden was his thin place when he gets behind the tiller or whatever he does, I don't know anything about gardening, that's when he felt really, really close to God. Other friends that I have, their thin place is when they go out and maybe ride horses or go out and go fishing or they go out into the woods and go for a hike or kayak. They, that's when they feel the most close to God. We might also have a particular person in our life who is our thin place. Whenever we're with them, we see the Spirit of God so active within them. We can see the fruit of the Spirit just so bountifully in their lives, and we know that they're a safe person to be with. They know, we know that they're a person that they can relate to uh, on every level, and, and even if they don't get what we're going through, they'll be with us through it no matter what. Do we all have people like that? Maybe a brother or a sister or a friend or a neighbor or maybe even somebody at church that we, can, we just know we can be ourselves around them. They give us, in other words, a taste of heaven. As I mentioned to some people in Bible class, one of the most sacred places in my own life is anytime we're gathered around a campfire and we start to sing some of those old camp songs like We Shall Assemble on the Mountain or Light the Fire or maybe even a, an old hymn like What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Those to me are some of the most sacred times in, in, uh, my, in my life. And going to church camp this past week made me realize of how hungry I've been for those thin places in the last few months. Do you ever feel like you just go through the motions? Do you ever feel like you're just kind of, you know, when you read scripture, you're engaged in scripture. When you're prayer, you're engaged in prayer. But it doesn't quite hit like it does in other times. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like it does in other times. You feel maybe a little disconnected. I've kind of felt like that in my life here recently. And church camp has, has made me realize how much I just hunger for that kind of deep intimacy with God, that kind of connection. And I just wanted to share that with you, just to let you know that if you've ever felt like that, you're not alone. Uh, you're not alone. If, if things haven't connected quite right, then you're not the only one who's experienced that. That even people like me, I'm supposed to be the preacher and, you know, the example for, we go through stuff like this all the time. Let's take a look at Ezekiel chapter 17, uh, verse 22. And we're going to talk about a thin place that God is creating in the world, the kingdom of heaven. The scripture says, thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar. I will set it out. I will break off a tender shoot from the topmost of its young twigs. I myself will transplant it on a high, mount, on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel, I will transplant it, and it will produce bows and bear fruit and become a noble cedar. Under it, every kind of bird will live, and the shade of its branches will nest winged creatures of every kind. All the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. 
I bring low the high tree, I make high the low tree, I dry up the green tree, and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will accomplish it. Now, this passage, when you just read it kind of out of its context, it seems kind of strange. What's, why is God talking about trees and taking a small tree and making it into a large tree and taking a green tree and turning it into a, a dry tree? Well, in Ezekiel's day, he kind of pictured the kingdoms of the world as a great forest. And the biggest, sort of baddest tree of them all was Babylon. It was the mighty cedar. It was the one that was ruling and reigning over the earth. And what God is saying in this passage is even the mightiest kingdom of all time, you know, and from their perspective, will be supplanted by the kingdom of God. It might start out small, it might start off kind of humbly, but all of the, the rules that the empire has set, these people flourish and these people don't. Or maybe even these people only exist to serve these other people, to make them richer, to make them more mighty, to make them more glorious. God is going to one day through the kingdom of God turn all of that over on its head. That's the image that's being used there in Ezekiel 17. Though Babylon was thriving, they weren't thriving because they had done something good. They were thriving because of injustices they have committed through taking advantage of God's people, through taking them into exile, through, putting, uh, through, through um, making slaves out of people that they had conquered. They had gotten to their place of prominence through many kinds of injustices. And God is saying that when the kingdom of God arrives, it's going to flip all of that over on its head. That's the idea in this, in this uh, very ancient parable. Now, let's remember all of this, and let's go to the book of Mark. Let's go to the book of Mark, chapter 3. And we're going to take a quick look at the passage that we looked at last week. Um, we looked at Mark chapter 3 uh, last week in round, round about verse 23. Mark chapter 3 and verse 23. If you recall from last week, Jesus was casting out demons. He was going from city to city, healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons, causing the blind to see, causing the deaf to hear. And one of the things that his opponents started to say was, well, he gets his authority, not from God, but from the demons. That's why he's able to have so much power over them. His power is, is demonic. And what Jesus, how Jesus responds is, in verse 23, he says, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has rised up against itself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But then he says this, No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. In other words, how, how Jesus frames his whole ministry in the Gospel of Mark is, he had come to bind the forces of evil. Whether that was Satan, whether that was the empire, whether that was uh, the religious establishment that had, that had marginalized some of those uh, through setting up uh, systems of buying and selling and trading within the temple, whatever it was that was against God's will, he had come to bind that up and to toss that out. He had come to overturn the systems of injustice and introduce a new kind of empire, a new kind of kingdom called the kingdom of God, which is an ironic name for it because it doesn't function like a kingdom in the way that we think of kingdom functions at all. And so it's within this context that we come to the parables I want to focus on today in Mark chapter 4 and verse 26. And think of them uh, as a way that Jesus is casting out Satan. Read these parables also with the one we just read in Ezekiel about how God is overturning the systems of empire and providing a system of justice. Uh, the kingdom of God is, is a way of saying what the world would look like if Jesus was truly Lord and nobody else was. That's what, the kingdom of God, that's what the kingdom of God looks like. Let's read verse 26 of Mark chapter 4. The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow, and he does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe at once, he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. It's kind of a strange parable, but... It's, it's imagery that everybody in the audience would have been familiar with in Jesus' day. We go and we scatter seed on the ground. We go and we plant crops. And though we water and though we might fertilize them and though we might pray over them and sit in our gardens and talk to them, we can't make those plants grow. 
And for many of the, for most people in the world, we don't really know how all this works. We don't know the, how photosynthesis works. We don't know how uh, the conversion of, you know, of, of sunlight, and oxi- uh, sunlight and carbon dioxide into, uh, into carbon dioxide and glucose works. We don't know how that works. We might be able to reiterate the formulas and write all that out, but we can't make the plants grow, just like we can't add a, a foot to our own stature. Well, except for maybe Troy. He could probably do that. But nobody else can do that. We're all... We are all very incapable of making plants grow. And yet God says, this is what happens. They go and they spread the seed, and then it grows up. And even though he doesn't know how, he goes out and he gets the harvest. But notice the human agency in this passage. Though all of the heavy lifting is done by God through his creation, through planting, and, and, and uh, or rather through all these different things growing up out of the ground, it's the, the human that kicks it off. In other words, in the kingdom of God, we have human participation in the spread of the kingdom, in overturning the the systems of injustice in the empire, like in Ezekiel's day, and overturning the systems of injustice in our day. God expects us to participate. We we might not be the ones who finish the job, but we plant the seed. We get it rolling. We, We kick it off, and he works through people like you and me. The plant doesn't grow unless the human goes out and spreads the seed, and that's what we are here for. We spread the seed of the kingdom of God, whether that's through doing good deeds, whether that's through preaching the gospel, whether it's through being a good example, whether it's through just adding that much more love and grace into the world in the midst of so much fear and anger and hatred. You and I get to participate in this beautiful new creation, this new reordering of the world, as we're going to see in a little bit, uh, this new kind of humanity. Jesus tells another parable in verse 30 that's similar to this one, uh, but he, it, it, it takes it from just a little bit different angle. He says, With what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Do you see that little that last line there? So that the birds of air can make nests in its shade? That's the connection back to that Ezekiel passage that we read a moment ago. And if you remember, it wasn't just robins that came and nested in the shade of, uh, of this mustard tree. And it wasn't just cardinals, or it wasn't just sparrows. It was every kind of bird and every kind of winged creature goes and participates in the kingdom of God. That is to say, in this new thing that God is doing in the world, in, in planting this new tree, this new kingdom, this new way of being human into the world, it's not uh, an exclusive enterprise. It's not something that's just fit for one group of people or one nation or one language or one identity or one race. It's something that's meant for everybody. You and me and everybody down the road, we're all invited to participate in this kingdom. But do you see how, counter, how counterintuitive that is? through the lens of empire? What do you do with other people in an empire? They're a commodity to be sold into slavery or to be put to your own good, to your own use. Uh, They are someone to exploit. They're someone maybe to be afraid of. We don't want them coming here, or we don't want to go over there where they are, or we're threatened by them. It's kind of like whenever Egypt was in power, and uh, the Pharaoh gets a little bit uncomfortable because... The Israelites are growing, and they're, and they're being blessed by God. And what does Pharaoh do? He wants to have all of the young men executed, right? Why? Because he's afraid. When you have an empire, you're threatened by other people. But in the kingdom of heaven, it's not something to be afraid of. It's something to embrace. This wonderful diversity that we have in the world, all these different cultures and languages and, and peoples and customs, they can all be incorporated into the kingdom of God. Out of all, all, the birds of the, all the birds of the heavens, from the vulture to the eagle to the turkey, everybody is welcome in the kingdom of God. And there's quite a few turkeys in the kingdom of God, right? The point is, though, is that you and I get to participate in that. We are not people who just sit on the sidelines and watch God at work. We get to go out and plant the seeds. We get to start the conversations. We get to include those who we don't want to include, which may be uncomfortable at first, but it's what we're called to do in Christ. This is a way of being that overturns every conventional way of thinking in the world. Any, any type of exclusion, any type of, of, of hatred, any type of fear of other people dissolves in the kingdom of God. 
because everybody everywhere of all time are welcome to participate and to be in this new thing that God is doing in the world. I want to show you one more passage, and this is the passage from 2 Corinthians that we read during communion. Let's go over there and look at this one more time. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, and we're going to take a look at verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to begin here at verse 14. I want you to see what is at work uh, in this new creation. Notice what compels us in verse 14. What is it that, that urges us on? He says, For the love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all so that those who live might no, lo might no longer live for themselves, but for the one who for their sake died and was raised. In other words, the reason why we see things in a new way is because, uh, is because God has shown us a new way through his son. Jesus didn't come to die for one specific economic class or one specific group or people who, uh, who vote a certain way or who live a certain way. Jesus came to die for all. And if God loves all, then who should we love? We should be loving all as well. We shouldn't be excluding anyone uh, from the kingdom of heaven. We should preach the gospel to all. He goes on and he says in verse 16, from now on, therefore, we regard no one from a fleshly or from a human point of view. That's the way of the empire. As, as we just sang a second ago, God opens up our eyes to see in a new way. No longer do we worry about where someone's from or what language they speak or, or how much money they make. Or, all that stuff is pointless when it comes to the kingdom of God. We've all been made into one new human family in Christ. Everything that divides us dissolves, and the only thing left is unity. Satan casting out Satan, the accuser casting out the accuser, that's no way for us to live. Throwing out uh, accusations, throwing out slander against other people, that's all from a human point of view. And now we no longer live in that way. God has created a new kind of person. He's created a new humanity in which we all get to participate. He says in verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, a new creation has come. Everything old has passed away. Look, new things have come into being. In other words, if you've really bought into the gospel of Christ, if you've really bought into the good news that God loves you so much and that the Holy Spirit is with us and that Jesus died and was raised for us, then why are we living in that old system of pain and corruption and hatred and anger and fear and division? Why do when we sit down at night, do we, do we turn on a uh, media that its sole purpose is to make us divided so that they can make more money? Why is it that when we uh, spend through our days and we get any moment at all spare of spare time, we go on the social media that's designed to make us more divided, that's designed to make us in, be in competition with each other? Who gets the most likes? Who gets the most shares? Who gets the most clicks? Everything in our world is almost designed to keep us from seeing this, that in Christ there is a new creation, there's a new way of viewing things, and it's meant to bring us all together and reconcile us all together, and yet so much of our world, so much of our politics, so much of our media, so much of our news is designed to make us divided. In other words, it's anti-Christ, it's anti-gospel, it's anti this new humanity, this new way of being. So much of our world profits off of division. But God has called us to live off of mutual love and sacrifice and care for each other. Look, he says, new things have come into being. In other words, this is another way of Paul saying, you've written this letter to me asking me all these questions about who's right and who's wrong and who's eating the right things and who's not eating the right things and who's wearing the right things when they worship and whose gifts are the best. He's saying, don't you see, that's an old way of viewing the world. You've not yet been transformed. And neither have we been transformed when we put so much stock into that old way of being. We have to to see things in a new way. We have to pray that God will open up our eyes. Jesus said, or rather Paul says in verse 18, and all of this, this new creation, this new thing that's going on is from God who reconciled to us, or who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. 
Everyone think about this for just a moment, okay? Just focus in on this key idea. God reconciles the world through Christ, and he's given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, it is your, yours and mine chief goal in life to be agents of reconciliation, Recon reconciling us to each other uh, in one family, reconciling, of course, us to God through Christ. That is our job, planting this seed that Jesus talked about in Matthew, or rather in Mark chapter 4. In, in other words, any time that we buy, any time that we buy into the division and the hatred that's in the world, we are working against the main thing that God has called us to do. Anytime we send that mean text or spread that line of gossip or share that, that hateful meme or whatever it is, we are working against the main thing that God has called us to do, to be agents of peacemaking, agents of reconciliation. There is a lot of profit and a lot of popularity in this other way of viewing things, but God has called us to see things with new eyes. God has called us to spread the good news of the kingdom of heaven, a place where everybody is welcome, a place where our sins are totally forgotten, and a place where all things are made new. Let's lay down this old way of living that only brings hatred and division and sadness into the world. And let's take up this new light of reconciliation, of, uh, of reconciliation, of radical hospitality, of love, of grace, of mercy, and of true justice. Not the justice of the empire, where we tear down others to build ourselves up, for the justice of the cross, where we give our own lives, where we think not of ourselves, in order that all may hear uh, the good news of Jesus and be uh, joined to this new family, this new way of being. Here in a few moments, uh, we're going to sing a song that Jason's picked out for us. And uh, it's, what song is it, Jason? The what? You can say it louder. What is it? Yeah, build your kingdom here. We're going to finish what we just read a while ago. And this, this song might trick us a little bit because it talks about uh, healing our land and uh, getting our nation back and everything like that. And as Americans, we have a tendency to think the good old U.S. of A. But let's think about the nation of Christ and how the nation of Christ, the kingdom of God, in other words, has lost its way by buying into all different ways of division and, and uh, the opposite of reconciliation. And let's ask God not to heal other people, but to heal ourselves right here. If the good news doesn't transform us, 